Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about the inguinal ligament and the associated inguinal canal. And hopefully at this point you understand a little bit about the structure of the anterior abdominal wall, the muscles there, the rectus sheath, the aponeuroses, and so on and so forth. And we're going to use some of that knowledge and learn a little bit about the inguinal canal and the ligament. Now, let's just get familiar first with the anatomy over here. So over here on the lateral sides of the wall, of course, we have the external oblique muscle. We have the left one over here, the patient's right over here. Um, in the middle, we have the rectus abdominis. And of course, naturally, unless we peeled it off, like we peeled it off here, it's covered completely by the rectus sheath. And then the middle of the rectus sheath, which divides the quadrats of the muscle itself, we have the linea alba. Okay, but the point is we have all this fibrous tissue in here, and that fibrous tissue is composed really of the aponeuroses of these three lateral muscles. The superficial one is the external oblique, but remember deep to that we have the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis. All three of those muscles have an aponeurosis, and so all this white fibrous tissue is really just composed of that. Okay, it's fusion of those three aponeuroses. So why don't we actually talk about the inguinal ligament first. So this structure right here, this uh, rope-like band of, of fibrous tissue, this is the inguinal ligament. Up here it actually connects to the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS, and then down here it will actually connect to the pubic tubercle. Okay, And of course this would be the left inguinal ligament and the right inguinal ligament. Okay. And right near the inguinal ligament, we're going to have this inguinal canal. Now, in the picture, uh, they've kind of just imagined the inguinal canal. You actually wouldn't be able to see the canal because there's actually some tubing that actually goes through it. Okay, But the inguinal canal is a passageway from the abdominal cavity through the anterior abdominal wall. So it basically is a hole, although there's things moving through it, that connects whatever's inside the abdominal cavity basically through the anterior abdominal wall. So it allows it to penetrate this all this fibrous tissue right here and ultimately make its way into the genital region. And we'll see why that's important in a minute. Okay, now in order to form the passageway, you have to have some folding of some of the aponeuroses there. And it turns out that the folds that allow this passageway to form are specifically folds of the external abdominal oblique aponeurosis. So it's folds of the external oblique aponeurosis that allow this canal to be formed. Now when you look at this, there's actually two rings here. Okay, You see a ring right here and then a second one right here, where you can actually see this tubing emerging from. Those are the superficial and deep inguinal rings. So this one right here is actually deeper. This would be the deep inguinal ring. This one where this tube is emerging from anteriorly, this would actually be the superficial inguinal ring. And so basically this purple dotted line here connecting the two rings, that is the passageway. And so this tubing, as you move through this passageway, this inguinal canal, as you emerge posteriorly from this ring, that would basically take you into the abdominal cavity. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So why is it that we need an inguinal canal? Now, of course, women have an inguinal canal as well, but I'm going to use an example in males because that actually is a little bit more obvious as to why we would need one for males. Okay, So consider the fact that males carry their reproductive organs on the outside, that is the testes. The testes are contained in the sac structure called the scrotum, and the testes, of course, are manufacturers of sperm cells. Now, one thing that may not be apparent to you if you haven't taken reproductive physiology yet, but the sperm cells are made in the testes. The actual semen is not made in the testes. Okay, Only the sperm cells are made there. The fluid in which the sperm cells will live, which is the semen, is actually made in structures inside the pelvic cavity. Okay, the abdominal pelvic cavity, like the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, all that stuff is really in the pelvic cavity. Okay, So how do you get the sperm cells from this outside structure? Right, The, the scrotum is not internal. 
It's outside of this. How do you get those sperm cells from this outside structure to inside the pelvic cavity, which is deep to this fibrous tissue? Well, one way to do it would be to move it up through a canal, right? So for example, whenever the testicles make sperm cells during ejaculation, those sperm cells will have to travel up through this cord which goes through the inguinal canal, and then the other structures will allow it to mix with the, the semen from other glands and then ultimately come out the urethra, okay? So this cord right here that actually runs through the inguinal canal in males uh, is actually called the spermatic cord. Um, in women, uh, there's no testes, obviously, so they actually have an equivalent structure called the round ligament, Okay, uh, but both of these are structures that actually move through this inguinal canal. And the whole idea here is to connect things that are actually more superficial to go through this wall into the abdominal or the pelvic cavity. Okay, and there's some other things that actually run through the inguinal canal, like inguinal nerves and blood and lymphatic vessels. I think that makes sense to everybody. So here's another look at part of this. Um, this would actually be probably the spermatic cord if this were male. You can see the spermatic cord moving up through the superficial inguinal ring. It's going to go a little bit deeper. Um, and then the deep inguinal ring is going to be basically right here. Because what's going to have to happen is the spermatic cord is going to have to move through the superficial inguinal ring, cross through all of this tissue through the canal, and then it's going to emerge through the deep inguinal ring. And notice on the other side of the deep inguinal ring, you can see all these blood vessels and then this tube, which is probably uh, the vas deferens or ductus deferens, which eventually will merge with the seminal vesicles and so on and so forth, okay? But the point is, is in order to get this structure up through the outside and into the pelvic or the abdominal cavity, it's gotta traverse this tissue. And so it has to enter it through the superficial inguinal ring, go through the inguinal canal, and then emerge through the deep inguinal ring, and the contents are right here as you can see. So one more thing, let's talk about a clinical application of this. It turns out that the, some of the tissue around the inguinal canal can actually tear or rupture. And when this happens, you have what's called an inguinal hernia. Okay. Um, an inguinal hernia is exacerbated by weakness in the anterior abdominal wall. And so if you bend a certain way or if you're uh, lifting too heavy a weights, then this tissue can tear. And whenever this tissue tears, over time you can actually have protrusion of abdominal contents, like the small intestines, through that herniation, okay? which is not good. And oftentimes, if it's severe enough, it'll need surgical correction. Well, there's a guy named Hesselbach who determined that uh, there's a specific spot where the tissue is automatically the weakest and therefore uh, more susceptible to an inguinal hernia, and it's called Hesselbach's triangle. And Hesselbach's triangle has three boundaries. One is the inferior epigastric artery, second is the rectus abdominis, and third is the inguinal ligament. Okay, So we can actually see it better if we look at this picture right here. So this region right here forms the triangle. So on one border of it, we have this inferior epigastric artery. Down on this border, going downwards, we have the rectus abdominis. And then here, we have the inguinal ligament as the third border. And so in this triangle, which is Hesselbach's triangle, this would be where uh, the tissue is actually the weakest just by default. It's not uh, by anyone's fault by moving in a certain way. It's just weaker here. Uh, this would actually be where you'd be most susceptible to tearing that tissue. And that would be what's referred to as an inguinal hernia. Okay. Um, one other thing, inguinal hernias can be either direct or indirect. A direct inguinal hernia is one that's acquired um, usually a little bit later in life. Um, so I mean once you're an adult. Okay, doesn't mean you have to be an elderly person, but these are usually caused uh, by moving too fast a certain way, um, lifting too heavy a weights, um, and what'll happen is that the tissue will tear because when you contract muscles in that area during uh, weightlifting, you actually tense those structures and they can tear. Um, you can also have an indirect inguinal hernia, which is congenital. Uh, these are inguinal hernias that you're born with, um, and they're usually due to the fact that actually 
Now, these structures are not automatically uh, fused um, before you're born. They actually uh, have to have some structures pass through them, particularly in males, because you have to have structures outside like the scrotum. And so sometimes those these uh, fibrous tissues don't completely fuse and so you're left with a tear there that just never fuses. And so that would be an inguinal hernia that's genetic, okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the inguinal ligament and the inguinal canal. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.